one of the questions that is in my mind is whether we are imposing more costs on ourselves than we get in benefits through our MDL system. Um, maybe it's okay because it's just for pretrial, but as we know, pretrial ends up being the ball game uh, in the vast, vast majority of these cases. Very few cases are sent back to their original uh, courts. And so uh, those are some of the ideas that inspired uh, this conference for today. And uh, I look very much forward uh, to um, participating and hearing about what uh, people think about those and other issues. Uh, I've been charged with um, leading off today by moderating a roundtable discussion with uh, these three very distinguished people to my right. I would like to introduce them briefly and then um, start peppering them with a few questions about their own experiences with our MDL system. But I want to invite you to raise your hand and join in our discussion uh, as it unfolds. Uh, we're not going to wait until the end to take questions or comments from, from the audience. Feel free to raise your hand and participate uh, as things unfold. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, we have Timothy Pratt. He's the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of Boston Scientific. And I must say, when I read over all of your responsibilities, I really uh, wondered how you had time to be here today, <laughs> Tim. Uh, you are in charge worldwide of the legal functions, global compliance, government affairs, and several other things at Boston Scientific. So very, very impressive. You're involved in LCJ, DRI, the New England Legal uh, Foundation. And uh, so you're a very, very busy man. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, our, uh, to, uh, to Tim's right, we have, um, uh, now I just, I just found out how to pronounce it, and I did it right, and now I've forgotten it. Molony. Molony. Molony Morthy. Vice President and Associate General Counsel of Bayer, the head of litigation at Bayer. Uh, you've also been involved in some very interesting organizations, including one that, that struck my eye as the National Center of Law and Economic Justice. Um, and so thank you for joining us uh, today as well. And then um, on the far right up here is Dan Troy. Senior Vice President and General Counsel of GSK, formerly known as GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, used to be a partner in my old firm, Sidley Austin. Uh, you were the Chief Counsel, Food and Drug Administration, been in involved in the ABA, American Law Institute, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So very impressive group. Thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us today. I wanted to, to start off, if I could, by asking Dan a question. Um, and uh, when we were preparing for this uh, roundtable a few weeks ago over the telephone, Dan said that uh, his company had recently requested that an MDL be created. Did not oppose one, but you wanted one. And so that means there must be some good somewhere in this MDL system if you wanted one. And so I'm curious if you could just start us off by telling us what are some of the things you think are working about the system Sure. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, I want to be very clear. I'm not speaking on behalf of GSK. My views are my own, or actually those of my my partner in crime, Leah Lorber, who was, you know, <laughs> prepared me. Um, I feel like a little <laughs> bit of a fraud because, as a general counsel, I'm not really sure I practice law anymore, and I was an appellate litigator, so I've never actually been a trial court litigator. But I, ha I have I have been uh, spending a, li a little bit of time looking at these issues, and obviously I lead a function where we l have litigated in a lot of MDLs. So I, I think the answer to the question for us is that MDLs can work. Right? They can work. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a few little facts about the, uh, the case in which we, or the cases which we sought an MDL. This is a generic product called Zofran. It's now generic. It wasn't generic, um, obviously, when we introduced it. But since 2006, it's been generic. It's a product, actually, that is now owned by Novartis. We sold it to Novartis, but we retain the responsibility for the litigation. And one of the big issues for us is, A, whether or not people took, actually took the GSK slash Novartis branded product, um, or whether they took the generic. Our view is if they took the generic, they should be suing someone else. Um, that is, unfortunately, in a few places, a controversial issue. It shouldn't be, but it is. Um, and we have a really great preemption argument. The th this is an anti-nausea drug that was approved for use in the cancer space but has often, often been used in uh, off-label by women who are pregnant. Um, 
And there w were some two very, very, very weak observational post hoc studies which suggested that there was um, a birth defects issue. And, uh, and the, the gravamen, the thrust of the plaintiff's claim is that we should have changed the label and had the pregnancy warning be much more substantial. The FDA has actually directly spoken to the precise question at issue, to use Chevron language, and, um, and, and has said, no, the, the labeling is, was correct and is correct. So these cases should not be there. So why did we seek an MDL? Because we think that these cases can and should easily be disposed of either on preemption grounds or on the grounds that as the innovators, we should not be liable. So I would say that MDLs do have their time and place. Um, but there are a couple of issues that I'll just sort of tee up that I know we discussed beforehand. One is, one issue that, and I'm not sure how to solve this problem, is there is a bit of a tendency, maybe more than that, of bias towards the judges simply because you, when you see so many cases, you tend to think there must be a there there. That doesn't mean there is a there there, but you just see them over and over again. You're like, oh my gosh, there must be something here. Um, there was an, a very interesting article that Marty Reddish wrote in which he raised the question about whether or not there's adequate due process for the individuals uh, on whose behalf the due pro you know, on, on who, who are on whose behalf the MDL is being litigated. I'll leave that issue to the side. I thought that was really really interesting. Um, one of the points you made, Brian, is that when you do have central planning and when you have one decision making such a difference, it is very important to be able to have some kind of right to interlocutory appeal. Um, what we have seen is some real abuse in bellwether trials, right? either bellwether trials that the defendants haven't agreed to, or worse than that, and this is, I think, totally unconscionable and probably unconstitutional, multiple bellwether trials. right? I mean, it's one thing to defend one claim, David against Goliath, but when you've got seven Davids against you know, what's perceived to be Goliath, that's really very hard to defend. But the issue that for, that for us is the one that's most salient that we care a lot about is and, it, it, and this should be such a good government, easy thing to fix, is uh, that, that in these MDLs that we get granted what are called, some people call them Lone Pines motions, but the idea is that the plaintiff should have to have a modicum, the slightest modicum of proof that, for example, they actually took the medicine. And you might think, well, that's ridiculous, of course. But what we have found is sometimes we go years before actually, uh, including you know, millions, amount, million, millions of dollars in discovery before we find that actually, guess what? This person didn't take the medicine. They never took the medicine, or they took the generic. Um, so, so we have, in some cases, sought, successfully sought these Lone Pines motions where we do, guess what? A lot of these cl claims wither away. So I think that if the defendants are going to be put to the burden, if you will, or in this case, you know, we did seek it, are, are, are going to be uh, required to litigate 50, 60, 70, 100, hundreds, thousands of cases in one forum, that at a minimum, the plaintiffs should be required to bring forth the smallest amount of, you know, a modicum of proof that shows that they actually did, for example, take this medicine from this company. So the bottom line, again, is I think that there is value in the centralization, but it has to be done well and it has to be done right. And too often, um, both in our direct experience and from what I've read in the literature, it's not always done right. So in, in the case that you requested the MDL because you thought you had a strong preemption argument, were you going to be able to get the whole thing dismissed on a motion to dismiss, or are you going to have to go all the way to summary judgment? We are hoping that we can get the whole thing dismissed on, on motion, motion to dismiss, dismiss on yeah. at least one of two grounds. Now, <laughs> an innovator liability, obviously, if the person took the GSK medicine, then you can't get them out, get out on innovator liability. But you should be, but for the people who can't show that they took the GSK medicine, those cases should not be litigated against GSK. There are, no, there are no take backs in this world, so. <laughs> <laughs> Can't undo it once it's done there, yeah. So, so, so Tim, what, what do you think about this? And can I call you Tim, or do you prefer Timothy? I hate Timothy. OK, good. <laughs> uh, so, so, so Tim, what do you think about this question of the benefits of the MDL? Do you guys ever request MDLs, or do you fight all of them? Uh, the answer to those two questions is no and yes. <laughs> no benefits, you fight them all. We never, we never ask for one, and we, and we fight them. And, and by the way, thank you. Uh, I guess I'm not speaking for my company either. 
Uh, <clears throat> but let me say this. I think it's fair when you take a look at MDLs to say who really likes them. I think on any issue, it's fair to say, does one side like something more than the other? If, if you do a poll of a rule and all the defendants say we love it and all the plaintiffs say we hate it, I think you gotta take a look at it because there's some disproportion. So take a look at that in the context of MDLs. Who loves it? <clears throat> well, plaintiff's lawyers, they're the ones who disproportionately ask for them. They're the ones who want to get on the steering committee. They, they're the ones who want to be able to gather, mostly in the mass tort context. That's, that's the MDL world in which I have the greatest sort of concern and recommended uh, changes. Uh, so plaintiff's lawyers have an opportunity not only to get money from settlement from their clients' settlement funds, but also from this common benefit fund, if they're on the steering committee, and do the work. Uh, so most plaintiff's lawyers would say, it's just fine, don't tinker with it. You know, we love the idea that we have a claimant, we just put together a master complaint that's very generic and the merits aren't challenged for a while and we sit back and wait and hope that it's settled. On the defense side, it's quite different. Uh, I have experienced both, before I became general counsel, I was with a, with a law firm and I handled MDLs uh, as an outside counsel. And now that I'm uh, general counsel of a company, we've been caught up in MDLs. So I have it both as the lawyer and as the client. So what's, what's, what's the problem, Pratt? I mean, why, why, why do you have problems with the MDLs? In the mass tort context, I have troubles with MDLs for a variety of reasons. One is, merits ought to count, you know? I mean, whether you have to pay money, whether you have to defend something, you ought to at least put some modicum of proof that your case has merit. MDLs generally take that out of it. They basically become like coupon settlements. Hey, you have a claim? Okay, give me a, give me a postcard. I'll put your name here. Well, someday we may get to it, but you don't need to prove anything. So there's a disproportionate sort of element of proof required uh, in, in, in MDLs for a long period of time. Secondly, there's a disproportion in discovery. Think about it. I mean, for the first year of an MDL, if not 18 months, who bears the brunt of the effort and cost of discovery? It is all defendants. Depositions over when you retain this and how do you produce this and we want to talk to this uh, this this uh, uh, employee, that employee, we want to do a 30B6 with 25 different categories on it. So when do the plaintiffs, any individual plaintiff, has to prove that their case has merits? So there's a disproportion of discovery in the early stages. And then what happens is, particularly the, the MDLs where there are product liability cases where a lot of people use the product, all of a sudden, the combination of lead generators, uh, plaintiff's uh, advertising, third-party funding generates numbers. It becomes much more mass than it does tort. And these masses of people sort of sit there in a warehouse or a parking lot or purgatory, an old Catholic, uh, <laughs> someplace where they don't have to prove anything. They just sit there, and if you get to the point where you have to prove something, guess what? 25, 30% are dismissed with prejudice. That's not right. So I think in that broad context, I think there are some changes that can be made to the, uh, to the rules of civil procedure. It's interesting when you take a look at section 1407 of rule 28, which actually created these consolidated proceedings. Usually when there's a statute that's created, you, you then generate like a mile high of regulations and rules that kind of you know, implement the statute. In the context of MDLs, you really don't have all rules of civil procedure that guide an MDL judge in what to do. And so what we're proposing, I'm, I'm president-elect of Lawyers for Civil Justice. In August, we submitted uh, something to the Advisory Committee on Civil Rules that proposed changes to the rules of civil procedure, changes that judges can look at and apply in the context of these mass tort consolidated proceedings. Uh, and I think those, if implemented, uh, 
will will sort of reduce some of my anxieties. The funny thing I would say is this idea that you only have like one deposition and that's it. Uh, trust me, as a client, I've got witnesses who've been deposed 25 times. Now, not just in the federal court MDL, but state can talk some consolidated proceedings here, there. I mean, it becomes sort of a deposition factory. And I don't hire people whose job description says submit to depositions and litigation. <laughs> they actually have day jobs. And these depositions are taking them away from the day jobs. Uh, so changes, not tweaks, because I think there have to be some foundational changes to this. Uh, but I think they're needed and, and would be helpful to the advancement of the pursuit of civil justice. Malini, do you guys ever request MDLs or do you fight them all too? Um, we, uh, in my current job, I have not requested an MDL and we have most recently fought them. But maybe to kind of step back, because I always ask what is the problem for which we're trying to solve, right? And I think Tim hit upon it which is, I mean, I've had MDLs that are securities MDLs, antitrust MDLs, um, you know, that is not what we're talking about. And I think it's really the mass tort MDLs. I think it's no accident that we have three lawyers from pharmaceutical and medical device companies. Um, because if you're looking at the top 20 MDLs, which account for 35%, I think, of the civil docket, um, you are looking at largely mass tort MDLs that involve pharmaceutical and um, medical device defendants. And um, which, so I think there's no accident to that and I think we really have to kind of hone in on that and understand why it is that we're, where, where our complaints are and where our challenges are, are sort of, are specific to those or more generally, I mean you could include asbestos and other personal injury. Um, in the same context. And to me, there's some irony in it when you consider how heavily regulated we are and how, you know, um, and it is well that given the labeling regime and the warnings regime, and I understand where it comes from because there's some history there um, in terms of uh, the industry and the evolution of it, but where we are today and compliance regimes and all of that today, I think there is, and in, in just the relationship with the agency and in terms of the regulatory process, um, I, I think that uh, uh, it, it poses some tremendous challenges where I think MDLs are essentially turning into victim compensation funds, and especially as applied by judges. And if you start first with the panel itself and you know why, and the merits point is one that I think is so important because I think what's happened is defendants have lost faith, and not complete faith because there have been, and it's not that we have to win everyone. I think people assume when I say this point that I only think an MDL is good when I win on the uh, preemption or Daubert ruling. That's not the point. The point is just, the confidence that the judge that you have is going to give due consideration to the merits. But some of the language starts with the panel itself because we've had a number of panel arguments where when we make the argument about merits, about if you build it, they will come, all the reasons we're challenging it, um, you know, and the panel's response is, well, you guys settle all of them anyway. <laughs> And, you know, and that happens more often. I mean, you should read the transcripts of the panel, right? And that is, and the panels, there is really no transparency to what the panel's decision-making process is. We know what the factors are, but what is the transparency? There's very little transparency to that. And so, um, you know, I think that that is, and there's no appeal process to it. And we are caught in some kind of quasi you know, class action process. It's not Rule 23. We don't have the protections of Rule 23. It's something in between. And I think that it starts with that. And, you know, speaking of the rules and why I think what LCJ is doing, but I think equally on the other end with Fakala, is I think it really starts, and a lot of what Dan's identified, is this sense that the federal rules are suspended as to the defendant and in this asymmetrical litigation that is an MDL, right? 
and it is that and it is that judges believe and and they have i mean let's that's sort of the heart of our system is judicial discretion but i do think the federal rules are meant to give a sense of consistency fairness efficiency so that if you're a litigant in a federal court in new york uh, and that you have confidence that you're getting the same you know um, application of the rules and the system is working for you in the same way as a litigant in the federal court in California. And I think we lose that in an MDL to a large extent. I think in, in and just given how much um, of the civil justice, civil docket is with a, a very small number of judges and the amount of discretion and power that they have, um, I think we've got to bring a little bit more um, meat into the rules and clarity um, rather than leaving it as ad hoc as it has been and leaving it to individual judges and their view that Rule 16 pretty much affords them a really vast array of power to do what they want in terms of an MDL and their approach to an MDL. Well, let's, let's start on one of those rules that we might impose upon all MDL judges if we could. So all of you have discussed the need for more individual scrutiny of the merits in these cases that are filed. Lone Pine orders, does that solve the problem? If every judge requires <coughs> that process to be followed, does that solve our merits problem? Anyone? Well, so I think it would help a lot does it solve all of the other problems that um, we talked about in terms of potential bias, in terms of variation, in terms of you know, not being able to um, uh, get, a, get a ruling uh, from an appellate court about a, a potentially you know, problematic decision? No, I mean, it, it, it's a very important start. And I'll note that the uh, legislation that is pending on the Hill does have a fix on that. Um, we'll see if that can get through the Senate. Um, uh, so, so there are, you know, proposals that would fix it, but that's one of quite a number of things that I think need to be fixed. It would be, it's very helpful. We have found that when we can actually get that information, it does make a really big difference, but I don't think it solves all of the problems that have been discussed. Why would judges not go through that process? Uh, it seems like basic common sense, and it's pretty minimal bar that the plaintiffs have to actually... That's a good question. You have to ask them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we certainly request it. We certainly ask for it. We haven't always gotten it. We haven't always gotten it in a timely fashion. And of course, if it takes years to get the Lone Pines motions granted, then during that time, there's, as was mentioned uh, by Melanie, a, a, a very expensive discovery going on. Yeah, I think that... Um, <clears throat> I, I think lone pine orders would solve a lot of the problems, depending on what you do uh, with them. I mean, that, that's a broad topic that covers lots of different things. Uh, you know, if, if, if a plaintiff had to file an affidavit from, a, from an expert that says, <clears throat> I've concluded within a reason there's a claim, that'd be awesome. I just don't think any judge is going to do it. Remember my standard? If one side loves it and the other side hates it, that would fall in the category of defendants generally would love that, plaintiffs would hate it. And, and though I think it would solve problems, I don't think that's the only way to solve the problem. I think that you just think about it this way. You know, plaintiffs, I mean, defendants don't invite the litigation. Plaintiffs are the ones who drive the litigation. And I think it's important for a plaintiff, individual plaintiff, and individual, individual plaintiff's lawyer to understand that they have to present something to support their claim, and they have to defend that claim through some, some mechanism. The forcing them to prove it is to file a complaint that has some specificity to it under Rule 8 uh, that, that you can look at and go, well, you really have a claim or you don't. That's not done with master complaints, by the way. Number two, produce some materials early on by way of answering interrogatories or a detailed plaintiff's fact sheet, not one that says, what do you live and what do you like, but one that's got some real meat to it, because they know they have to put it together, and the plaintiff's already has to gather that information before it goes into this MDL. Third, 
I'm a big fan of requiring plaintiffs to submit to at least short depositions within, say, six months of filing the case. Benefit of that is you learn something about that individual case and the merits of it may, may allow a springboard to a motion. But secondly, it requires a plaintiff and plaintiff's lawyer to invest something into the process. Gathering information, submitting information, going through a deposition, understanding that this isn't a free ride. And I think it's this concept of a free ride, as Molody mentioned, that's created this sort of concept that, you know, numbers trump merits, and all you need to do is up the number somehow, and the merits won't count. And I think, sadly, in some respects, history has proven that to be the case. So I'm trying to turn it around and require a presentation in defense of the merits on the plaintiff's side as much as we as defendants have to do uh, on, the, on the defense side. And, and uh, so what kinds of things are we going to ask the plaintiffs to do? So f under oath to uh, fill out the questions that we have submitted that each plaintiff needs to answer about their case. Um, I mean, we probably can't require them to go to a doctor or some other expert at that early stage. It's expensive. They don't have to do that in individual cases. Um, but, but answering a series of interrogatories very early on, under oath, is, 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 is the direction you want to go. Yeah, the, the, the one thing I would say, and I know Molly has got some great thoughts on this as well, is that why is it that a plaintiff has to do so much less if it's an MDL versus if they go out and file their individual case. If they file an individual case, they're gonna have a Rule 26 F conference. They're gonna have to produce certain materials under the rules. They're gonna have to respond to a set of interrogatories, including potentially contention interrogatories. That's a way to learn about the case. You're gonna get a request for production of documents you have to respond to. They're then gonna be depositions. So I'm not saying you do all of that stuff in great detail, but there ought to be something like interrogatory, something like document requests, something like depositions that requires the plaintiff to do at least something beyond what they do now to present and prove the merits of the case. So I do think judges' views um, in terms of having some level of early vetting has shifted. And I do think they are buying in, depending on the MDL judge, to some form of early vetting. But it really is, and we do have plaintiff fact sheets, but I don't know that they're worth necessarily the paper that they're written on, um, because I don't think it's, uh, because the, the repeated number of times to amend, and then ultimately, you know, it, it just doesn't, uh, it's, it's not a, the best tool, I think, in terms of trying to vet the cases. It's, an, it's a tool. Um, and it's the one we have amongst others. But I mean, minimally showing you took the product and that you suffered an injury is, is you know, whether related or not, will debate causation seems to be, at minimum, has to be. How would you do that? How would you show that? Just a, I a declaration that, under oath that I took this product? Uh, that could be one way, right? The or some should kind already of say that, shouldn't it? prescription. I mean, there are ways in which you can do that, yeah. right? Exactly. Sure. It's, there's uh, the, certainly. Um, but, and I do think that switch, I think what's happened is in, you know, what judges have seen is that they, 30 to 40 percent of claimants in a settlement are getting zeroed out. Those are people that shouldn't have ever been in in the first place. And that's the problem. And why are they, by waiting till the end, you're actually, and this whole numerosity issue, it's to drive up the overall value, right? And they really should be eliminated in the front end. Um, I think, you know, while I, I do think this is very important, I, uh, for, I really believe that interlocutory appeal is what we need. Um, because, and I've even heard, you know, members of the panel, and my own view is that those early dispositive motions, um, you know, I'm interested in the f Dan's, you know, seeking the MDL where you've got these preemption and innovator liability arguments. Um, we've got preemption arguments in uh, one of ours, or you, we almost always have Daubert arguments. Uh, but um, is that, it, I think the interlocutory appeal is critical because I think the reality is, if you look at MDLs, once the defendant loses those motions, 
you're headed towards um, just intractable litigation and towards settlement, right? That's, and let's just be honest about that. You don't have to, uh, because I, I actually don't believe it. I'm in a litigation where we've lost those dispositive motions. I feel very, I'm, I'm in several of those, and I, ha I feel very strongly about the products, and I'm gonna challenge it, and uh, we'll get to the appeal. But the once, you know, when the plaintiff loses, they've got their appeal. They have final judgment. They're going to go and get their appeal. And you see that in those litigations where preemption or Daubert motions were granted um, in the past year, year, a couple of years, right? They get to go to the second, third, fourth, ninth, and I think in those litigations. When we lose, we're trying cases, right? And here's the perverse issue is that if you keep winning trials, you don't get to go up. And so then you're looking at 1292, and how hard is a 1292 petition? And it a lot depends on the judge. And so that is, to me, the, the, the real challenge for us and the sense of not having review of the merits. Right, because you're in this, again, you're in this intractable situation. And I think everyone would benefit um, from that review. I think defendant plaintiffs would benefit from the review too. I understand the perspective that that's the ball game once the defendant loses. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't believe it's the ball game. And I certainly don't behave that in the manage of my management of our litigations. Um, but I think that's where I feel that certainly early vetting is an important point, but really if we're talking about merits review, I think interlocutory appeal on dispositive motions um, is critical. And, and so on motion to dismiss and summary judgment, what about Daubert uh, rulings? So I would put Daubert preemption would probably be the two areas, you know, in our world that are critical in terms of review. Because those are, you know, any of those global issues mm -hmm. that uh, cover all of the cases, uh, general causation, Daubert, obviously, I think are the, the two critical ones, mm -hmm. certainly in this world of mass tort litigation. I was thinking to myself, would Congress have to pass a statute to do that? or could the federal rules of procedure do it? And I guess the federal rules were amended to allow interlocutory appeals and class actions if uh, you don't like the certification decision. So I guess I'm not sure why the rule makers couldn't do an MDL interlocutory yeah. appeal rule. Yeah, um, it would be akin to the Rule 23F yeah. petition, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think the hard part is managing what is truly dispositive and what truly has global application. And I will say that this is where, you know, we as we have to admit our own kind of um, role in all of this. I think we became, we challenged probably Daubert in places we shouldn't have been challenging Daubert as defendants, where we should have just acknowledged general causation. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think we've been in some ways our own worst enemies, and I think there's a hard, it's hard because you don't want to waive issues. You want to preserve issues. It's the same with in limine motions. Judges complain all the time. You, you know, both sides file umpteen motions. I, I think we create, we've been sort of uh, created some of the, the issues ourselves, and so we have to have um, some um, restraint in what we view as truly dispositive and what we're gonna ask because I think otherwise we're gonna have the entire judiciary opposed to us in terms of this issue. Would you let the appeals court have discretion over whether to take the appeal like we do with the 23F motions to kind of police that, uh, you know? Well, I mean, I'd love for it to be automatic, but okay. I mean, you know, <laughs> let's be a realistic, but a compromise would bar. be fair for them to have the, uh, to make it discretionary. Yeah. I assume, uh, Dan and Tim, you guys like the interlocutory appeal idea very I, well. I was just going to add, just yeah, sure, to Brian, sure, I think it's particularly, when you just look at the number of cases and the extent of the civil docket we're talking about locked in and MD, locked in these MDLs. I mean, 35% in 20 MDLs. It just seems to me uh, unbelievable that you can't have review of those cases 
because they're in an MDL and um, you're, it's not, and I think everyone will say, oh, you, you ultimately have review, but let's be honest. How many MDLs are really getting review at that end stage? I mean, once you lose a trial, sure, but I think it just makes it incredibly challenging. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, my, my, my view on it, I, I agree with Molony on this, and, and so to ask the question she raised, what problem are we trying to solve? Mass tort MDLs are big deals. They cost a lot of money, there's a lot of risk. So think about a situation in which all of those matters rest in the non-reviewable discretion of one judge selected by a judicial panel. And that judge can either look at the merits of pleadings or not, can decide whether discovery can be had against plaintiffs or not, rule on motions in any form or fashion, dictate what motions can be filed, dictate the timing of the resolution of those motions, decide whether bellwether cases should be done or not, decide whether they're 10 or 20 or one bellwether case, decide whether they're consolidated or not, and who is in a position to, whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant, to have a decision that you're aggrieved by, reviewed by somebody? And I think what we're proposing here, at least I am, are two sets of things that allow for this discretion to be exercised and reviewed. One is a change in the rules that provides some guidance, because uh, I think there's a void there. And number two, some mechanism that doesn't require you to go up to an appellate court every month to say, I don't like this discovery order, but at least some mechanism to go up on significant matters and have that MDL judge's discretion reviewed by someone because those decisions have consequences. That's, what, that's the problem we're trying to solve. Is, is there a way to define significant matters? Um, you know, is there, is there? Yeah, I'll define. Yeah. Yes, if, you, if, you, <laughs> ahead, if the advisory committee would just say, it's up to you, Tim, why don't you go ahead and put those together? I'll, I'll put something. I'll, I'll put Dan, I'll, I'll put something together. I'll talk to Dan and Molly. We'll delegate and I'll give to this group. I'll we'll take that. input yeah. from anybody, but right. this is Tim's rule. Uh, no, I, I think, I think uh, Molly and he hit it. I think there, there are some sort of, and, and we know that, whether there's an individual case or consolidated cases, decisions that are pivoting decisions in terms of where that case is going in terms of outcome. You know, Daubert's won, preemption's won, motion for summary judgment, those kinds of things, you know, can pivot litigation from sort of one side to the other. And I think those kinds of things, I'm not talking about little discovery disputes, I'm talking about consequential decisions that can have an impact on the course and outcome of these consolidated proceedings. Those are the things that we ought to have a right to go up and have an appellate court take a look at it, or at least decide whether to take a look at it. And it sounds like you would throw in the bellwether plan as one of those things that should be appealable. Uh, I wouldn't put in the bellwether plan because no. my proposal is that the rules should not allow bellwether trials. I see. Period. <laughs> <laughs> That's so another the way rule, to solve if, the problem. If the rule is no bellwether trials, and an MDL judge sets a bellwether trial, yes, I want to be able to appeal that. <laughs> now, uh, so we've talked over and over again about how much discretion this judge gets. Um, is there a way that we can improve the process of picking? who the MDL judge is. You know, right now it's done by the, the panel. The panel is selected by the Chief Justice. He was a pretty conservative guy, he was a corporate defense lawyer. Um, do we need to improve the process of who gets on the panel, of who the panel picks for the judge? Should we allow both sides to have peremptory strikes of, of judges they don't like? Um, is there something that can be done to improve the judge picking process? What they did? Yeah, so while I think that um, in theory, the idea of having preemptory strikes on judges is a very attractive one, I think that is a very tough sell. I mean, you know, the, the, the myth is that all judges are created equal, they're all equally good, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's a bit, to me, that's a really big uphill push and fight. That doesn't mean it's not, the, not a good outcome or the right thing to do. 
Um, this is more of a question for the panel that has more experience with you know, directly in front of MDLs than I do, but is there a modicum of training that we should require before a judge becomes an MDL judge? I mean, a, a modicum of experience, uh, either in their personal background, they've actually litigated cases, you know, MDLs, which would disqualify me. They, um, they, they, you know, um, have you know shadowed a judge who actually did one? You know, one of the things that I hear the, the discussion being about is how important it is that these one that these individual judges get it right. You know, the, the vast discretion that they have. I totally agree with cabining their discretion through things like the appellate process um, and requiring Lo Lone Pines motions, banning bellwether. Agree with all that, but is there something that can be done that's really much more feasible to upscale? the consistency and quality of the judges who are making these decisions. Any other ideas for Im improving the judge picking? So let's, let's think about how it's done. And I'm not saying it's always done this way, uh, but my experience is it is largely done this way. The plaintiffs file some cases in federal court, sometimes more in one court than another court. And, and a judge you know, gets assigned randomly to those cases. And then maybe weeks, months later, uh, there's a petition to the judicial panel. And what you hear is, well, this judge has experience. This judge is already sort of invested in it. And so why don't we go ahead and give it to that judge without a consideration on whether that judge is really good for the process. And, and I, I think that I'll, I'll, I'll just echo what, what Dan said. You know, my experience is MDL judges you, 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 all judges are really, really smart. And I like all of them, by the way. Um, <laughs> everybody, every one of them. Uh, but the I think, just for the record, but I think, that, I think for an MDL judge, it's not just knowledge and skill, it's, a, it's temperament, it's patience, it's strategic thinking, it's the kinds of things that I'm not saying some have it better than others, but I'll say that. Some have that better than others. And those are the people that I believe, those judges, who have proven that they're pretty good at navigating through these kinds of MDLs, they ought to get another one, and maybe another one. I'm not saying create a sort of a patent, you know, judgeship kind of thing. But there ought to be some feedback that the panel gets on MDL judges. I haven't had that, by the way, and I've handled a lot of MDLs. No one has said, what do you think of this person? And if, if the plaintiffs love the person and the defendants hate them, well, that's, that's something you've got to weigh in the balance. That may not be the judge for an MDL. I used to say as a young lawyer, I want the judge who, when I walk into the courtroom, he says, what do you want today, Mr. Pratt? <laughs> that's what I want. Then I realized that that's not really very fair. I just want a fair judge. A judge who sort of takes a look at the merits, sort of navigates that, that middle ground where both sides go, you know, I didn't get everything I wanted, but I was treated fairly. And I just think there are judges who, who, who are able to do that in, in the most difficult of circumstances. And I say that when you have thousands of cases on your docket, you have hundreds of lawyers, all want the same thing. You're trying to navigate state court judges who want to sort of sabotage the process. Uh, I love all state court judges, too, by the way. Um, I mean, it, it, it complicates things. And that, boy, you almost need a, you know, a, a judicial politician states person to be able to sort of handle that in a way. Uh, and, and I just think more attention ought to be paid to finding those kinds of judges versus who was the first judge who got randomly assigned this case and this venue. Yeah. I think it's fairness and I think it's trust in the process, right? It's not that I'm looking to win everything. I know that's impossible and you know, and there are probably times when we shouldn't be winning. And it's really though it's trust in the process and trust in the neutrality of the arbiter of that process. And that's where I think it's when both when one or the other side doesn't have trust in that neutrality. And trust in the process, I think, is when we, you know, you 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 lose faith, and I think that's some of the challenge. 
Um, you know, I do think it, my concern, if we kind of only go to experienced judges, is we're losing something. Because I've had first-time MDL judges who've been better than many of the experienced judges I've had and who've managed to, through the process, who understand it, who've educated themselves and um, approached it, um, you know, and, and, and managed them very effectively. So I think we lose a little bit of that. I think the challenge for the panel is really this um, lack of real clarity and transparency in terms of how they reach their decision making. I know they give those, those opinions uh, once they've decided one way or the other, but to really understand what, what ultimately is governing it. How much are they considering the merits or are they not? And um, I do think we should dig into whether there should be more merits consideration. Are we going to move more towards rule 20, you know, what you have in the case of uh, rule 23? which we're somewhere in between, or is this really just a procedural mechanism, right? And I think our challenge right now, it's not even so much of the, uh, it's really, we're somewhere in between. And I think that's where people feel a little disconcerted, right? Or certainly I do, um, is that we're in this in-between situation. Um, the, and so I think, and the other thing is we've moved away from, historically, my understanding is, is that you're only supposed to be asking for a district, right? You're not actually supposed to be naming a judge. And we have completely shifted ground where we're now horse trading on a judge, right? And it was, you know, you'd, you'd ask for the district if the panel decided to consolidate. You'd go to the chief judge of the district, depending, I think different districts were, work differently, but then the chief judge would decide, right, who was going to get that, uh, get that MDL. And we've completely shifted ground on that. Um, so I think that's some of the challenges in terms of the panel itself and the hearings before the panel and how we're operating in terms of that decision making. I, I don't have the panacea for it. I don't even have, I, I, you know, I think it's a very, uh, we've got, there's got to be some thought to it, um, but I can certainly have identified some of the challenges of it. So Tim, I love your uh, evaluation and feedback idea, right? I mean, one of the things that, uh, that we, we, we've seen is that when there's transparency and when there's feedback, for even in the, in the form of something like naming certain jurisdictions, hell holes, judges take notice, they don't like that. They do start to modify their behaviors and clean up the behaviors, not necessarily the judge themselves, but the judges that oversee that. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say to a panel, you know, you know, police yourselves, guardians, you know, police yourselves. After an MDL, you should seek feedback, just like, you know, in our companies and in our firms, we do all the time. Um, and if someone, you know, gets uniformly bad reviews, you, the panel, should, as re responsible, essentially officers slash executives in the judiciary, in the judicial branch, which is its own, you know, organization, and with some degree of hierarchy, of course, the chief justice sitting at the top. If if someone gets panned universally or is is really identified as not fair, they shouldn't be named to the next one now. The people who were stuck with them for that one, bad. But at least you'd be, you know, improving Helping the process someone, yeah. over time. <laughs> Sorry? You can save someone, if not yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a right. question from the audience. Yeah, go ahead. Has anyone given any thought to the concept of having more than one MDL, I mean, uh, more than one MDL judge, perhaps three judges presiding over an MDL? Certainly they'll, you know, be expected to coordinate their activities. But you wouldn't have necessarily one decision maker. It would be almost like having input from three judges you know, in connection with an appeal. We wouldn't just have one person's view on how the litigation should be managed and you know, what, what decisions should be made on merits issues uh, or procedural issues, but you'd have the input of three different judges. I don't know if that's really been talked about much, but it's, um, it just seems that it might be better than the current system. And then I also had a question for Tim mm -hmm. about the bellwether issue. I agree with you, the bellwether system is flawed, deeply flawed. But when you have a situation where you've got you know, a judge 
you know, uh, there's no lexicon problem. The case has been filed in the district where the judge, the MDL judge, is sitting. Can you prevent that judge from conducting the first trial, whether you call it a bellwether trial or not, it, it is at least de facto a bellwether trial. How do you prevent that from happening? Would you require remand of cases before there is any trial to their you know, initially filed districts or what? So there's two different issues there. Well, the second issue, it's not like there's a request for legal advice and you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I know there is an, in, let me talk about Bellwether and I'll, I'll, I'll let Mullen and Dan take on, on, on the other one. But, uh, you know, I think the, the, the answer that, you know, there's a lexicon case that allows you to sort of say that you can refuse to allow an MDL judge to, to try the case in his or her venue when it actually could properly venued someplace else. Uh, it's challenging because you, you basically, if the judge wants to do that, you have to say no to the judge. So it puts you in a tough spot sort of politically. Uh, my view on, on bellwether trials, by the way, is, is not that I'm afraid of them because I've tried them, won them, uh, but let's do it. It's like I tell my children, can you do it and should you do it? Uh, I don't think you can do bellwether trials under the statute. It says these are consolidated for pretrial purposes. That's what the statute says. So let's change the statute before we can do this. I don't think you can. Secondly, I don't think you should, because I think bellwether trials aren't predictive of anything. You try 10 bellwether trials, and one side wins five, one side wins five. What have you proven? And I think sometimes that they're used to sort of a little bit of a hammer. Uh, and, and I, so my, my, my view about bellwether, bellwether trials, simply put, is that the answer is I'm not sure that they're statutorily authorized to do it. Secondly, even if the statute were changed and to allow it, I just don't think it delivers what you would want to deliver unless what you want to deliver is, is the sort of force of settlement because you simply don't want to keep trying cases in the bellwether context in front of one judge. I really want to dive into this bellwether issue in a few minutes because I think it's interesting that you're totally against them because I thought that they were helpful to defendants, so I want to learn more about that. But what about this idea of having a panel of district court judges? It's not unheard of. We do it in um, electoral disputes, you know, there's mm -hmm. the, the statute that takes it straight to a three-judge district court panel for those kinds of disputes. Would that be an improvement rather than all your eggs in one basket? You've got three baskets now. <laughs> what do you think, Dan? I think it's intriguing. Um, I, I am aware of uh, the three-judge panels that there are in gerrymandering cases because those I actually have litigated. Um, and. I, I think overall, you know, in some senses, three is better than one. I think, you know, you lose a f some of the efficiencies. I mean, coordinating the schedules of three judges. Now, I guess it helps if they're all in the same district. But if all in the same district, if they're all from the same district, are you getting the kind of diversity of opinion that you might, you know, want or need? Or is, is there really going to be kind of more rubber stamping? If you take three judges from three different districts, then you know, the scheduling issues become very, 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 very challenging. Unless we actually move to a world, and maybe this is good, maybe this is bad, of more virtual um, hearings, right? I mean, if you, if, you know, if, you're, if everybody's willing to do their hearings on, over Skype or over, you know, some, you know, VTC t type of situation, then that becomes much more tenable. Um, I think it's intriguing. Uh, it's worth, 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 worth some thought about. I don't know, <laughs> part of the problem is I don't know how you pilot it, right? Unfortunately, you know, in, 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 in the corporate world, in a lot of other contexts, you'd launch and learn. Um, you know, you pilot. I don't know how we do that, really, yeah. in the judicial context. Well, to the extent that the statute allows them to do whatever they want to do, I guess they could be allowed to do this, too. I don't know. Does the statute say it has to be given to one judge? I can't remember exactly what it says. But Alex, you had a question, too. And then uh, we'll turn to Professor McGovern. Related to that topic of whether three judges should be involved in the case, um, what about a more modest version of that, which is to say that the presiding judge cannot be involved in settlement? So it would uh, take the decision-making power over 
as Tim said, the ability to file motions and, and, and deciding those motions out of the hands of the person who is trying to uh, get the parties to uh, reach an agreement. Except some judges will sort of assign that settlement authority to a magistrate judge uh, who, so you, you can try to cleave it, but I think that it, it, it's sometimes hard to do, which is what I'd worry about with three judges. First, I don't know why three Article Three trial judges would do it. They would go, this is crazy. They're used to like being the deciders and to put them in a panel with like a bunch of arbitrators. I don't know why, why, why they would do it, but I think it's an intriguing idea. I agree with Dan. So yeah. Professor McGovern, do, do I remember correctly, you had a, like a five judge proposal at one point, didn't you? you know, I, I think I've had every proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Both of those suggestions I did propose. Uh, the second one, I actually, I like better, uh, where you bifurcate the role for litigation and settlement. And in the Sagenta cases, that's basically what's been, been going on. So that one, it seems plausible. The resistance I got was uh, are all Article Three judges are created equal. I mean, that phenomenon is really difficult to overcome in the selection of judges, in reaction about are they good judges, are they bad judges, in the lack of ability of the panel to, uh, to judge other judges because they see them in a setting that's totally different from the trial of a case. And so someone might be quite congenial in that setting when they're terrible in, in the courtroom. So this is a phenomenal problem to which there is no solution that I know of other than the training which I've pushed pretty hard uh, with very, very little success, except for the fact that originally the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation did not allow non-lawyers to attend their meeting at the breakers. It was all anecdotal trading from other judges, whereas now they're allowing other people to come in and give some education. But I think that's probably in addressing the caliber of the judge, which is really what you're talking about, that's probably the most promising solution. You know, and just on one last point on this, how to pick the judges, one of my colleagues at Vanderbilt, Tracy George, has done an empirical study on who gets picked as the MDL judge. And what she found was one of the biggest factors, if not the biggest factor, one of the biggest factors was, has that district court judge ever served on the JPML? Uh, <laughs> if they did, they were very, very likely to get their own Thanks. MDL. Yeah. Um, now, what about this bellwether trial matter? So you're totally against the bellwether trials. Now, you know, what we teach in the law school is that these bellwether trials are very helpful to everyone because you're learning something about the value of these cases. So if you win five and you lose five in the bellwethers, you can, you can surmise you're going to win 50% and lose 50% of the remaining 10,000 cases. And that helps you find the right point to settle. You know, a lot of stuff you learned in law school was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> With due respect to my professor. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I get sort of the concept, you know, the, you know, the bellwether, you know, the sheep with the little thing around its neck is like clinging around to kind of bring the herd together. I mean, it's a little farm boy, by the way. So I have to, uh, but... Uh, Listen, here's, here's the issue with, with, with bellwethers, and it goes to something Francis talked about, which is that, you know, what is the role of, of, of forcing settlement in consolidated proceedings like this? Because let's be clear, plaintiffs like MDLs because it's a mechanism to settle without doing much work, plaintiffs' lawyers, okay? Some defendants actually like it for that reason, too, because you bring them together, it's easier to kind of solve it. Um, so I'm against institutionalizing a settlement role for someone in the NBL context because it carries with it the implication that the job of these consolidated proceedings is to come up with a mechanism for settlement, which I think is helping sabotage the whole system. I think the bellwether process, when you ask somebody, what's it really do? What are you going to learn from these trials? And I think the answer is, well, you may get some idea of value. No, you don't. You don't get value. I mean, you're not going to, you know, if you've got, you have a thousand cases, you get hit for a million dollars, you're not going to, whatever that math is, you're not going to pay that. There's always a negotiation that goes into settlement. So, you know, whether you win or not is a factor. And if you try 25 cases, you get hit for $10 million in every case, my, 
that tells you a little bit of something. But at the rail, it, the never, it, it never <laughs> ends up that way. It never ends up that way. You know, sometimes defendants often win more than the plaintiffs. But at the end of the day, the bellwether process to me is that I just, I don't think they can, as I said. And I just think having that built into the process where a, a judge has the authority to dictate how cases are going to be picked, finding representative cases, which may not be representative at all of the total MDL cases pending, trying the case at great expense, and some I think you're going to derive a lot of information out of it. I think what you put into it versus what you get out of it is, is there's a mountain of, of difference. So part, part of the problem with the bellwether system is the, the, the plaintiffs just have the ability to manipulate because if there's a case that's called for trial randomly or that, that they don't like, they just dismiss that case. Now, again, you get into some really serious due process issues there but because you know, they're sacrificing that individual for the good of their, their, their fees. But, um, or for the good of the others, they might for say. For the good of the others, they would say. <laughs> but, but you know, ultimately, they just keep, you know, when we, we've experienced this, right? They don't like the case that's going to be tried. They dismiss it, and, you know, until they get the case that they like. That's a big problem. Now, they say you settle the cases if you don't like them until you get a case that you like. Well, and that's why if you're going to have bellwethers, and I'm very sympathetic yeah. to Tim, so Tim's argument, very sympathetic. Um, if you're going to have bellwethers, and you know, also very open to the argument that that's not even allowed by the statute, then they should be cases that are agreed. Yeah, agreed cases. So, but you agree with Tim? Get rid of bellwethers. I don't think that. I mean, we have not had the experience of trying them one way or the other uh, in in MDLs. Um, we, but but they worry me. So that means that. <laughs> If we don't do the bellwethers and you don't settle, that means these cases go back to their original district courts and it's going to be totally the way God happens, intended. happenstance. Who ends up getting tried first then? The plaintiffs are still going to delay the ones they don't want to try first. I mean, are we any better off having the happenstance of who gets tried first when they go remanded back as well, opposed well, to putting some thought into it? What you don't have is, the, is the, all the eggs in one basket situation, yeah. right? I mean. And, and it does distort, the, the whole purpose of this was efficient pre-trial discovery, right? Once you get into trial, it's a, it totally completely distorts what the original purpose of these, you know, the MDL was for. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that last point, right, is so rooted in so yeah. many of the things because the three-judge panel, if you go back to the heart of what an MDL was supposed to do, which both these gentlemen have said the purpose, right? was the coordination of discovery, the efficiency of that pretrial rulings, I'm not sure the, the three-judge panel adds anything to mm. that, right? It's now trying to manage the post-discovery, right, the trial element of it. Um, I kind of fall probably more in the, if the parties consent, right, to the bellwether process and the trials, both sides, um, I think it's a fair, it, it's a mechanism, a fair, we can judge that, but it's a mechanism in what can be very intractable. Um, I have lived the remand situation, and what you really see there, and is particularly, it's fascinating. Um, it's fine, we can manage it. I think defendants can actually probably manage it even better than plaintiffs. And in the remand situation, what you find is I've had you know the same expert, ex you know, excused and dismissed wholesale in one district court, partially in another district court, and allowed to testify unfettered in a third district court. I mean, what you see is the role of discretion in our federal system, right? And that is what you're throwing into. I think the challenges, and for the MDL, there's a real challenge. That MDL judge who sends back X number of cases into the system is heavily criticized by their fellow district court judges, right? Because there is this perception and this view that the MDL judge is supposed to wrap this up, right? In one fashion or another, once that MDL is given to a transfer, transfer judge, it is his or her job 
to solve it for everybody else, right? Bring resolution to it. And there's heavy criticism. And in fact, how the cases get decided is if you go to the Eastern District of Virginia with a rocket docket, that case is probably going to go first, <laughs> right? That's what actually yeah. happens, right? As opposed to, I mean, it's really that randomness. Um, and But I'm still not sure where we ultimately end up, but it's what the system, right? We were supposed to go try cases, we go try them. But I kind of fall on the, um, you know, if the parties agree, and it's probably where I agree, um, well, with a little caveat on the settlement point, because I think the settlement is really complicated with the whole common benefit fund, right? You have a MDL judge who is administering the common benefit fund amongst the PSC, right? Setting percentages of what withholding percentages of any settlement, um, and ultimately deciding the allocation of that. And having that same judge participate in settlement, I think, is a real challenge. And, um, and I also think that I think to me that is something that has needs to be unpacked more than we have, um, but I think that presents a real challenge for that judge um, in terms of being on both ends of that, and also trying to manage the merits. So I think the again another intriguing idea is um, having someone else have that role. Now if it's you know, it's just what is the party's role in deciding who that person is, right? In terms of whether it's a third party mediator or another, um, another judge. And I think you're going to have less discretion on the latter and, you know, some um, less involvement as a party in the latter and probably some in the former. But I think that's the other challenge that we haven't really talked about. But. Audience, yeah. Hi, um, my, my question is for you, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, how, how would you how would you quantify? You know, be very very specific. Yeah. Like if I was give you an example, an analogy, whatever. Um, if I was to purchase like a, a plain vanilla or stock option, and I want to want to use a mathematical model, uh, Black Scholes. So if 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 I'm a if I'm working as an account, let's say for a law firm, and I want to figure out how much this MDL litigation is, is going to actually cost the firm, and is it worth it in, in, in the long run? What, again, what mathematical or, or quantifiable or model, math model, uh, would you use or, or recommend for, for this type of litigation? Well, I mean, I think we have to separate the claims into, into different buckets, and then try to come up with an average value of the claim in each bucket, and then multiply it out. I mean, I, I you know, it's so interesting to hear my, my uh, co-panelists up here talking about uh, settlement as a bad thing because, you know, we really do teach it in the law school as a good thing, that trial is a failure. Uh, and that's the law and economics view is that if you can get to the same point you would get at by going through a trial with avoiding litigation expenses by settling instead, that is the better goal of the system. Otherwise, you're, you're just wasting money on, on litigation. And so it's interesting to hear uh, the panelists up here really see settlement as the failure. No, we're not, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm saying forced settlements are a bad thing. And forced settlements where the system allows numbers to overwhelm you and, 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 and an incomplete consideration of the merits uh, where you're being forced to settle, forced into bellwethers, it's that situation where you basically are in a corner and have no option uh, that 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 I'm, I'm I'm opposing. You know, we'll settle a lot of stuff anyway. We'll try and we'll settle whatever we do. But I think that the way to do it is to is to just bring the parties together with a common frame of mind without extraneous pressures put on them to come to what's this number? What did we do with this litigation? My view is there's a lot of things about the MDL that inject extraneous factors into whether you settle or not. And keep in mind the bellwether piece. I was in an MDL once and the judge wanted to do bellwether cases and I said, why? He said, two reasons. One, so both sides can see the other side's case. And two, it may help us understand the value of the case. So I said, all right, I get that. 
So why don't we just have like a mock trial? Just three <laughs> days, put a jury there, put three <laughs> juries there. I don't care, put four juries there. You're there, the magistrate judge. We present things, you know, we keep everybody out. And then at the end of it, you learn something. We ask them what the values are. Guess who opposed that? Yeah. yeah. Plaintiff's counsel did not want that process. So I think there are ways to do it, and I agree with Molony. I mean, if the parties agree to whatever, then we ought to be able to do it. Uh, I just don't think it ought to be forced on. Yeah, I, and I want to add on that settlement point, right, it's the assumption of settlement, right? Yeah, that, Forced, that, that, it's the yeah. assumption of settlement. But I also want to add another point that it's interesting what you're saying in terms of you know, what's taught in law mm -hmm. schools and this view, you know, settlement for the folks in this room and for judges, once there's a settlement, they're done. But we're in companies, we're not making widgets, right? There are real consequences to we're settlement. Lives. I believe that strongly. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we, there are consequences where, you know, there are people who benefit from the products that we make and who, because of a settlement and because of litigation, are perceiving a shift in the benefit risk of those medicines and or devices and will opt out of it when they could have benefited from it. And I think that's, there are public health, public policy consequences. And if you see science and how science shifts, and, you know, I look at, for example, hormone therapy litigation, right, which I managed. Uh, and you look at the most recent JAMA article that says there's no difference in mortality rates for women who were on hormones versus women who were not, right? That is, you know, now we are how many years? 15 years after WHI. And that shift, but you look at what has happened in terms of prescribing and women wanting, and residency programs, whether they even teach um, you know, medical school residents about these products, there has been a complete shift. And that's a consequence, not just of litigation, but litigation and settlement played a very significant part. So I think that's part of what you're hearing, but it's not. There are, we, you know, of course there are times when settlement is appropriate. And, uh, you know, there are also, frankly, other mechanisms. I mean, I'm sure we're all very consumer-oriented, patient-oriented companies. Um, you know, there are, you know, patients do direct outreach. There are other ways, but it's the point that it is assumed, that it's assumed in the context of an MDL, that judges assume it. And I always like, because judges always make this point, 98% of cases, you know, are settled. And I, like now, I can go and say, well, I tried three this year. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to try another one. And I'm going to try another <laughs> one. I mean, you've got to, at some point, we also have to try cases, folks. And we have to try them and win them. And, you know, sometimes. We're, gonna, we're not going to win every time, but we have to do that. But I think that's the, that's the frustration you're hearing. That's a very interesting point. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I have a, a sense of urgency here listening to this, having been involved in many of these discussions over many years, and, and it's this. The, I, there's no question but the fact that there, this is a very problem, it's an awful problem. Unfortunately, it's been in place for many, many, many years. And most of the issues that we're talking about have been talked about for many, many, many years. And the question is really, you know, how does how does really this industry, you've got, as I've heard it, 50% of all the cases that are in federal court, civil cases, are in MDLs. And I would imagine that an enormous percentage of those are drugs and medical devices, right? So I, we have a magnificent opportunity here with the people who are on this panel. You're the clients, the, the academics can talk about it, the lawyers can talk about it, but it's, it's your business, it's your problem. And the question is, how can you get to some degree of closure with your best shot, right? And we have legislation. Of course, that process is intensely political. It's kind of less information driven. And then you got the rules committee. And I don't think that there's really anything else. You can train and stuff like that. But the solution to judges who have 
you know, variable ability to, uh, to be wise in making decisional outcomes really depends upon rules because it limits their discretion and you, go, you can get really a better chance that most judges will do the right thing if the rules are better. So you've got legislation, which is political. You've got the rules process. And I see now that the LCJ has got a proposal. So you then kind of think forward to how can that process work out well? What's it going to take? And I think just my own observation in listening to the issues in the discussion is that, in a sense, it's still too tentative. You say, well, let's try something. Let's, for example, the, you know, what should you have in order to prosecute the claim as an individual? Well, they have to do something like, well, you can't, you can't prevail in establishing that if it's they got to do something like, because anything that you do in that area will, will be greeted with claim or, uh, arguments that it costs too much money, it's unwarranted, it's unfair to the individual. So my own sense is that you have to have very specific proposals. And then number two, you have to have the data to be able to be impactful in the presentation. And I think that that is the huge deficit here. I mean, you guys collectively just sitting at this table are real, real smart, and you've got a lot of information. But to actually hold up under scrutiny in the Rules Committee, you've got to be able to say, well, what is the problem and how can you prove it? And I don't think that there really is a tremendously good flow of information on what all the problems are so that you can actually demonstrate them. You can say, here is this problem. Proportionality hasn't come to the forefront in mass stored MDLs. It's kind of like I forget it. Like, well, what's that? These are 5,000 cases. Anything's justifiable. How can you bring to bear data on what's actually happening in all of these different cases on a systematic basis so that you can have impact for a very discrete proposal? And I worry, just looking at it, I just reviewed the LCJ's thing. I don't, I don't know where it's going to come from. And so if you guys in you know, you know, a handful or maybe a dozen other companies are facing this problem, you know, is there some, you know, what's the plan for selling the solution to the rules committees? Sorry to make a speech, but it's such a great It's a good question. <laughs> what kind of data do you guys have over here? Well, I can, I can address it from, from the LCJ standpoint because I was involved in, in, in that. I think two things are going on, Dave. I think, I, one, I think MDL judges are beginning to see some of the frailties around the process right now. So I don't think MDL judges say it's going great. What are you doing telling me it's not working? I think a lot of MDL judges, you know, in the, in the, in the privacy of their offices would go, yeah, this is getting a little bit out of control, particularly in the mass torque products world. And I think there are things that are sort of driving that. I think the third party funding is becoming more of an issue. I think, you know, lead generation, advertisements become more of an issue. You get, you get judges like Judge Landau of the mentor uh, 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 MBL going, this is crazy. I'm seeing a bunch of frivolous cases taking up everybody's time and we've got to put a stop to it. So I think we start from the process. This is, this, they're increasingly, I think, beginning to see the problems that almost didn't exist back 10, 15 years ago. So I think there's a realization on the part of the judiciary and I hope the judicial panel that you know, we need to start putting some guardrails around this or we're gonna lose you know, the, the benefit of, of, of this statute. The second one is, yeah, you, you know, LCJ, you know, Washington Legal Foundation, the Chamber ILR, I mean, you, there's sort of a drumbeat now of people who say these are the things that need to be done better and differently. And, and built into that are articles that contain the data uh, that this is what this defendant had to go through. Uh, there's a little delicacy involved in that, frankly, when you are a defendant in an MDL. Uh, you know, there's, there's a time at which you, you've, you've got to be a little careful about what you say about it. But, you know, how long they go uh, and, and some of the recommendations we have, I think it's, it's up to us as defendants, as organizations like LCJ, as the defense bar, the corporate community to come forth and say, you know, these are things that can be done to make it better. 
so the next panel is going to talk about eliminating meritless claims. I'm going to learn a lot from that, my friend. <laughs> yeah, so I can provide some, some, some data. Of, this illustrates the efficacy and importance of Lone Pine's motions, and it involves our Avandia MDL, and Avandia is not a medicine. Ultimately, the FDA approved, you know, agreed with this much too late that should really ever have been subject to the kind of product liability attack that it was. Before the entry of a Lone Pines motion in 2008, 2009, we got about 145 cases that were dismissed for failure to provide a, a, a fact sheet. 2010 to 2011, after the entry of a, loan, of, an, of, an MD, of a Lone Pines order, we were able to obtain the dismissal of more than 2,500 claims. And then in 2012 to 13, we were able to obtain the dismissal of about roughly another 2,500 claims. So that, the entry of that one single motion made a huge difference. And I don't think anybody can argue that if these people can't even show that they took the medicine or got any one of the harms that are associated with the medicine that were the subject of the litigation, that they should have been in there for years and years. That's 5,000 plaintiffs that ended up being dismissed after the entry of the Lone Pines order, but we needed to wait two years before we got it. Could, could, could a scholar go through every MDL where a Lone Pine order was entered and find out what percentage of claims dropped away? Would that be easy for After a Lone Pines order? Yes. I mean, that could, that could, you, could, you could get that sure. data. The, the, is, is that data public in each case, or would I have to go to the parties to, to get that data? I'm not sure, okay. um, but, but I, I would imagine that most parties um, through LCJ would be, uh, LCJ for we'll, we'll the last happy to share Federal that. Rules of Civil Procedure project did a great job of collecting information about the costs of litigation um, on, on major corporations. I would, I'm relatively confident that that's the kind of thing that a lot of companies would, you know, yeah. Participate. Share, great. The, That's good. That's the good. data exists. It's harnessing it, right? Harnessing. And which yeah. is what I think, uh, to Dan's point, on the the amendments to the discovery and mm -hmm. the discovery mm -hmm. amendments in general, we were able to mm -hmm. pull together that data, whether individually or collectively. That sounds like a good research project. Another question back here. Uh, this question goes back about. 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> sorry. Um, no, no, it's just fine. It's maybe our last it, question, too, I'm sorry to say. We've got three minutes left. So uh, it relates to um, the, the practicality of remand in these mass tort cases where there are thousands and tens of thousands of cases. So, Mahoney, I guess it's to you. You, you. you suggested you've been through the remand experience. Could you just give a ballpark how many cases went back and what the, what the life cycle of those cases? Did it, did it go on for years? Did you try many, many cases, or did they disappear quickly? Yeah, we tried in total 23 cases, I think seven in the MDL, 16 after remand. Um, no, actually, some were state court cases, but we certainly tried at least a half dozen probably in the remand courts. Um, we, you know, the initial view, the judge initially said he was going to remand back um, 1,000 cases a month. It never turned out to be that, right? It's just the system can't manage it. Uh, there were, oh, I'm looking at Alicia, hoping she might remember how many total cases. It's, uh, there were at least t 10 to 20,000 cases, roughly. Um, and then we remanded back. Um, probably, you know, at a different pace. He then went to 400 a month, then it went to 200, then it went down to 100. And we agreed that there would be a mechanism before cases were remanded back, we would do some degree of case-specific discovery within the MDL. And so, you know, four or five depositions, the key depositions, plaintiff, prescriber, treater, um, it was uh, four or five, and then the process was that every few months he'd remand back um, anywhere from 100 to 200 cases. Ultimately, we remanded probably over 1,000 cases, if I remember correctly. I mean, we have the numbers somewhere, but I mean, it is a, we were taking statistics about how many briefs we were filing. I mean, if you saw the numbers, it was astounding, right? How many depositions you're doing at that stage, you are doing, that's why when you're talking about when judges or anyone or a party talks about remanding, let's say even a thousand cases, think about what that means in terms of depositions that you're gonna do, right? That's minimum 
in a and pharmaceutical or medical device MDL, 5,000 dep depositions. Think about how many days there are in a year, how many business days there are in a year, availability of doctors. I mean, it is, you know, there's a, there's some r reality that has to set in, and I think eventually set in, because after he realized, notwithstanding a thousand cases, the system can't manage it, you know? Okay, on, on that note, I mean, that's why we created the MDL, because the system can't manage it. But uh, on, on, on that note, um, we have to conclude our first panel, but please help me thank these uh, very distinguished guests we've had. Thank you.